Hey there folks. This video is going to be a little different from the average video you may see on this channel. And before we get into it, I want you to understand that I'm going to go through this video as though you, the viewer, already have a good understanding of the Dennis Martin case. Hopefully you do because you watched the video on Dennis Martin that I released last year. If you haven't seen that video, I would urge you to go and watch it. If you have the more missing 411 understanding of the case, then please go watch my video. I know many people, myself included, were surprised at the amount of information that's not present in many modern retellings of the Martin story. Either way, here is a one minute refresher on the Dennis Martin disappearance. Dennis went to the Great Smoky Mountains National Park with his father, grandfather, and brother in June of 1969. While at a location called Spence Field with another group of people, Dennis suddenly vanished while playing hide-and-seek with other children. The family notified rangers who immediately organized a search party. Sadly, the search was fruitless and Dennis was never found. Weeks after the incident, a man named Harold Key came forward saying that he was in the park with his family the day Dennis disappeared and had a strange encounter at Rowan's Creek, roughly seven miles from Spence Field. Mr. Key heard a child scream the word help and also an agonizing scream of pain. He also saw a disheveled looking man walking through the forest who entered a white car that was parked on the road and then drove off. There is no record indicating that Mr. Key ever stated that he saw a man carrying a child on his shoulder as has often been perpetuated. Now in this video, I'm going to respond to some comments and emails I've received since I released the Dennis Martin video. But more important than that, I'm going to go over some incredibly important files released by the FBI. But first, I just want to talk about the folks who have messaged me or left comments regarding their certainty that there are feral people or cannibals living in the Smoky Mountains. I just want to be clear that if you believe that, that's fine. I will always listen to your opinion and reasoning and keep it in the back of my mind. But in order for me to actually be swayed into believing in feral cannibal people, I would need some sort of evidence. The Dennis Martin disappearance has been used for years as evidence pointing towards the existence of either Sasquatch or feral people. One of the main takeaways of the Dennis Martin video I made was to show how the case is definitely not evidence of either. Since nobody actually saw a Sasquatch or feral person, which has often been reported. Now if you hear me say that and you either don't believe me or don't know what I'm talking about, Go watch my video. I'll link it in the description. A number of viewers have also sent me links to a fellow on YouTube who claims that these feral cannibal people exist and that they were involved in Dennis's disappearance. He also claims that the Green Berets came in to exterminate a bunch of them. I'm sorry, but that is simply not good evidence in my mind. If you're going to make a claim, especially one like that, you really need to back it up with some sort of evidence. I know that stories like that can really capture the attention and imagination of people, but I believe it does a disservice to the actual victims here who are Dennis Martin and his family. I would strongly encourage anyone watching anonymous people making extraordinary claims on YouTube to be skeptical. I always try to back up the things I say in my videos with sources from newspaper articles, witness statements, police reports, etc. Now, to be clear, I'm open to believing that feral people exist in the Smoky Mountains, but there is certainly a lack of evidence for it. The one man often referenced in the Dennis Martin case by Dwight McCarter I would not describe as being very feral. He had a small cabin in the woods, he had a name, people knew who he was, and would give him food and clothes. I dug around everywhere trying to find articles referencing feral people living in the Smoky Mountains, and I found none. All the evidence and witness reports in this case either point to Dennis getting lost or maybe dying of exposure or being attacked or kidnapped by a man driving a white vehicle. I believe the video I made on Dennis Martin does a good job of putting to bed many of the theories or questions that people have regarding the case. From the Green Berets who helped the search to the death of the FBI agent Jim Reich to the story of the Key family seeing somebody walking in the forest. I think it really answers almost all questions raised in books like Missing 411. The one loose end that I had in that video 
The one thing that always bothered me was the fact that I had no FBI report on the case. This is because if the FBI would not release the files on this case, it will always leave the door open to speculation that they are hiding something. And many people have expressed to me that they believe the FBI is hiding the evidence that feral people took Dennis. The FBI report on the Martin case has become rather infamous because of this. And I know a number of people who have tried to get this file and been unsuccessful. I know David Pilates tried to get it. I know Michael Bouchard, who wrote a great book on the Dennis Martin case, tried to get it. And yours truly tried to get it. I filed a request for the FBI's Martin file sometime last year and was actually given a full denial. To my knowledge, nobody was able to get it, and the FBI did not want to release it. Since the release of my Dennis Martin video, I have always believed that the FBI didn't want to release their files because they had a suspect in this case. Now, given the incident happened over 50 years ago, I believe it truly unfortunate that they were still hiding whatever information they had, because it could be used to end a lot of the leftover speculation about the case. Like I said, aside from finally discovering the location of Dennis himself, the FBI files are really the only loose end left in the case, in my opinion. We have answers for most everything else. And while I'm pleased to say that the FBI have finally released their files on the Dennis Martin disappearance, I can't tell you when exactly they did this because I don't know, but I have to think that it must have been within the last year because they denied my request for files not even a year ago. But as with most cases on this channel, even after I release a video on it, I continue looking into it. I continue looking for new information and tracking down new documents. The FBI made 133 pages of information available, and I'm going to go over the very important stuff in these reports and what they mean. So let's do this. One of the first things I want to point out is that the FBI being involved in this case is not unusual, because they were checking into the possibility of a kidnapping. The Great Smoky Mountains National Park is federal land, and the files state that the FBI would have investigative responsibility for any serious criminal offense that occurred in the park. The chief ranger involved in the case, Lee Snedden, also believed that the FBI were better equipped to investigate rumors and theories that continued to crop up throughout the search. Special agent in charge, Wallace Estel, the FBI agent in direct communication with the Martin family, talked to Mr. Martin about their jurisdiction in the case saying that the Bureau can accept no responsibility for a terrain search for his missing child, and that in the absence of some specific information indicating a kidnapping or other violation of federal law, they can conduct no investigation. Therefore, the FBI agents sat on the sidelines during the search, awaiting and receiving information that might eventually indicate a violation of federal law. These files will go on to indicate that Dennis's father, William Martin, would continuously try to convince the FBI to become involved in the search for his son. Reports also indicate a misunderstanding between Mr. Martin and the FBI, with Mr. Martin believing that FBI agents Wallace Estel and Jim Reich were actively investigating his son's disappearance. The agents had to clarify with Mr. Martin that they could not act without evidence of a crime. Both Jim Reich and Wallace Estel had to turn in sworn affidavits that they did not tell Mr. Martin that they were investigating Dennis's disappearance. The files also show that in the weeks and months after the disappearance, the FBI strongly believed that Dennis had simply become lost and likely died from exposure, stating that Mr. Martin prefers to grasp at some hope that the child was kidnapped and taken from the park. I was also happy to see that the FBI report made reference to Harold Key. Although his name has been redacted, his story is easy to identify. I had been disappointed that the National Park Service report largely ignored the Key sighting altogether because they didn't feel it was relevant. The FBI, however, at least looked into the sighting. It's also important because we get another narrative that disproves the idea that the man that Mr. Key saw moving through the forest was carrying something on his back. The FBI report describes the incident like this. On the day the child disappeared, he 
he had heard a scream late in the afternoon and thereafter got a glimpse of a man moving through the underbrush. Mr. Key was not well acquainted with the park and he was not sure where he was in relation to Spence Field from which the child had disappeared. Arrangements were made to have Mr. Key accompany an agent to the park. We know that Mr. Key did end up accompanying the FBI to the location where he saw the man and that they intercepted his vehicle en route to the location and took him there in their government vehicle. The report goes on to describe what happened next. In the park, Mr. Key pointed out to an agent and a park ranger the exact location where he was standing when he heard the scream. This point is at such a distance from the point where the child disappeared that in the opinion of rangers familiar with the park and considering the time element involved, it would not have been possible for the scream to have had any connection with the disappearance of the child. So I have two things that I'd like to point out about this narrative. One, I was disappointed that it does not mention the white vehicle that Mr. Key saw the man get into. Contemporary newspaper interviews with Mr. Key describe the vehicle, and Mr. Key also told Michael Bouchard about the car during their interview. Second, although the NPS and the FBI decided that the distance was too great between Spence Field and the location of the Key sighting, I still don't consider the matter settled. Mr. Key was never positive on the actual time of his sighting, and so it would have been difficult to gauge what was possible or not. Just so you are aware, the FBI estimated it would take three hours to travel from Spence Field to the area of the Key sighting. As a reminder, Dennis disappeared around 4 or 4.30 p.m. The FBI report lists the time of the key sighting around 6 p.m. The distance between the two areas is 7 miles. The files also show that the FBI was doing their due diligence during the vital days after Dennis's disappearance. They made note of people in the area with criminal records or people among the searchers who were behaving strangely and they interviewed them and confirmed their whereabouts at the time of the disappearance. It's also noted that the FBI consistently declined to conduct any investigation for Mr. Martin based on the many visions and insights of Cranks and others that have contacted the Martin family. This is referring to a number of psychics and clairvoyants who contacted the Martin family describing random locations where they might find their child. Mr. Martin wanted the psychic tips investigated, but the FBI refused. It's clear that the FBI was getting somewhat irritated of Mr. Martin, as they state that he began calling their offices every day relating new information he had received from psychics and visionaries. The files also contain a letter that Mr. Martin sent to Congressman John J. Duncan, where he describes his belief that the FBI is hiding information from him. Mr. Martin notes that in the initial search report that was presented to him, he noticed several items that were inaccurate. The items were small and had no bearing on the investigation, but it made Mr. Martin wonder what other information the FBI had that may be inaccurate. Mr. Martin says that he met with Special Agent Estel and asked him to describe his understanding of how Dennis disappeared. Apparently, Agent Estel had some minor details incorrect, and this really disturbed Mr. Martin. He then asked the congressman for a new investigator who was not already familiar with the case, so they may run an independent investigation that could then be compared with the current one. The congressman appears to have taken the letter seriously and even inquired with J. Edgar Hoover at the FBI regarding this case. As I've already stated, the FBI's position on the matter is that Mr. Martin misunderstood their whole intention of being there, and that the FBI was there almost as an observer until an actual crime could be discovered. There's also a narrative report in the files that covers the search for Dennis. In it, there is mention of extremely heavy rains that occurred at dark, on the day that Dennis disappeared. It goes on to say that Chief Ranger Lee Snedden believed that Dennis's body was washed into a crevice due to this heavy rainfall, and then it got lodged out of sight and perhaps covered with debris. The FBI themselves never went to the Spence Field location where Dennis disappeared because they believed there was no useful purpose in doing so, and they also state that the numerous press representatives on hand 
would have immediately inferred a kidnapping aspect. The narrative goes on to describe how Mr. Martin's mental health changed throughout the search. From initially being very frantic and searching and appreciative of all help, to coming under the influence of visionaries and being unwilling to accept the fact that Dennis likely perished, it states that he preferred to believe Dennis had been kidnapped and might yet be found alive. Next, I'm going to get into some information in these files that has been heavily redacted, including names and large portions of narrative. Nonetheless, some of these fragments we are able to read are very intriguing. On November 16th of 1978, nearly 10 years after Dennis Martin's disappearance, FBI agents who had never worked on the Dennis Martin case and were unaware of the incident, interviewed an incarcerated individual while in prison. This person stated that they were previously incarcerated with a man who had claimed to have kidnapped a seven-year-old boy named Dennis Martin from the Smoky Mountains and then sold him to another man. The FBI agents then reviewed some Knoxville News Sentinel articles about the disappearance of Dennis Martin in 1969, and they found a number of similarities between the articles and the information provided by the confidential informant. At this point, the FBI only knew the last name of this suspect, and they had to make a decision on whether or not to track him down to be interviewed about his whereabouts in 1969. They note that without a direct admission of guilt from the suspect, that it would be near impossible to prove kidnapping after 10 years. However, due to the nature of the case and the similarity in stories, it was decided that the case should be opened for at least a preliminary investigation. Due to the redactions in much of these reports, I am forced to do some speculating. But it appears that the FBI tried to track this suspect down by finding out where he was incarcerated when he told this story, and asking the warden there to search their files for any individuals with a specific last name that had been confined in that institution. The FBI were able to discern the identity of this suspect, and they retrieved a picture of him. They then showed this picture to the confidential informant to confirm it was the man who told the story about kidnapping Dennis Martin in 1969. The confidential informant confirmed the pictures presented to him were those of this suspect. Now, the informant also furnished a signed statement regarding the story that was told to him. They asked the informant about his willingness to take a polygraph test to confirm that he was told this story, and he advised that he would be all too happy to do so, and would even testify. The FBI then began seriously developing this man as a suspect in the abduction of Dennis Martin. The suspect clearly had a criminal record, but how extensive it is is unknown, because that all has been redacted as well. The FBI's first order of business was to track down the suspect's whereabouts. It appears they traced him through the penal systems in both Alabama and Tennessee. On January 16th of 1980, the FBI interviewed another inmate who knew either the suspect or the CI. It's hard to discern which due to redactions, but they described him as a compulsive liar who related many stories to him about past exploits, but has never mentioned anything about kidnapping of a young boy. By August of 1980, the FBI had discovered that the suspect had been paroled and was living in Chattanooga, Tennessee. The FBI was finally able to sit down and interview this individual on November 7th of 1980. Here they asked him about his involvement in the kidnapping of Dennis Martin and then selling him to an unknown person. In summation, the suspect denied the allegations against him and stated that the inmate who had initially informed the FBI about him was telling the story to try and get him in trouble because they didn't like each other. The FBI had no choice but to take the man at his word, as there was no evidence against him other than the word of another incarcerated individual. Okay, so that is the gist of everything that is in the FBI files on Dennis Martin. I do want to point out that over 30 pages are missing from the files due to exemptions but we still get a pretty good idea of the FBI's involvement in the Dennis Martin case. They were actively looking at potential suspects in a kidnapping back in 1969 and continued to do so up to 10 years later. To sum up, in 1969, they did not open an investigation 
because they found no suspects to actively investigate. Despite the fact that Mr. Martin continuously tried to get the FBI involved, it wasn't until almost 10 years later that a potential suspect came up because an inmate came forward saying he met a guy in prison who claimed he kidnapped Dennis and sold him to someone. We are still missing a rather large amount of details about this informant and suspect because of redactions. We still don't know if this potential suspect had anything to do with the disappearance at all because there is no hard evidence to link him to Dennis, and it's difficult to tell with the redactions who the report is referring to, but one of these men may have been a compulsive liar. The informant saying that he was willing to take a polygraph and testify in court, that is something, but unfortunately we don't know if the polygraph was ever actually administered because there is no report on that. So we are simply left with the fact that there was a suspect, the FBI was looking into him, there wasn't anything they could do because they lacked necessary evidence. This is the type of stuff that is usually the reason why the FBI won't release files on a case, because they don't want to release information to the public and possibly potential suspects about what evidence they have. Now we are over 50 years removed from the case and it is highly unlikely we will ever see any indictments in this incident because most everyone involved has passed away. That is, if Dennis actually was kidnapped. I still think the two main possibilities for what happened to Dennis are 1. He got lost while playing hide and seek and died of exposure somewhere. It's also possible he got washed away somewhere by the heavy rains as the chief ranger believed. Or if you've watched my previous video on Dennis Martin then you know there was some indications that there might be a child's remains in a place called Big Hollow not all that far from Spence Field. Number two is that he got kidnapped by somebody. There is circumstantial evidence to support both scenarios. On the kidnapping side of things, there's the potential that the man Mr. Key saw moving through the forest and getting into the white car was somehow involved. Dennis may have been particularly susceptible to kidnapping as he was learning disabled on some level. The FBI report notes that he had been sent to a school for children with emotional difficulties and a low learning ability. I'll also remind you that there was an anonymous report received by a local sheriff where an individual said that they saw Dennis Martin riding in a white car with a man not long after Dennis went missing. They gave the description of the man as bald and middle-aged. I would be curious to know if this description matches up with the suspect the FBI turned up 10 years later. Unfortunately, the heavy redactions make it impossible to know anything about this individual. So the mystery is still here. We don't know what happened, but there's another piece of the puzzle. We know what the FBI was doing and why they were doing it. There was no mention that I could find of feral people living in the Smokies being the culprit, or Sasquatch being the culprit. Still, to this day, I have not seen a shred of evidence that would indicate either of those two things had anything to do with this case. And trust me, I've really tried to find it. As I've said before, I think whatever happened to Dennis is decidedly human. From his father and grandfather letting him out of their sight for only a few moments and him running off, to the possibility that he was taken by some unknown man. I hope that this video has been informative for you. I know I always find it amazing when we continue to learn more about a case as old and as well known as this. And until next time, thanks for watching.